Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Stella Muruchu. Um, I work as a lecturer in education at the University of Sterling. Um, and I work for, um, you know, as a network co convener with uh, Diane Cantali from the University of Dundee uh, and uh, Lisa McAuliffe, who is uh, from the University of West of Scotland. Um, this is uh, the first CIRA Inclusive Education Network and the main aim of this event is to launch basically the network. Um, thank you for being here today. We've got, uh, we'll start with our um, two speakers who are experts in uh, inclusive education uh, and then we will continue with a discussion. Um, the discussion will be coordinated by Diane. Uh, please add any comments or questions uh, into the chat box uh, during the discussion and uh, you'll be asked to be um, unmuted to ask your question later. Uh, but let me yes introduce uh, our two speakers for today, uh, Dr. Margaret Sutherland from the University of Glasgow and Dr. George Head from the University of Glasgow, uh, who will lead um, this conversation looking at the progress of inclusive education uh, in Scotland. Okay, and to you, Margaret and George. Thank you, Stella. Can, um, is everything okay? Can you hear me? My Zoom picture has disappeared off my screen, which means I can't do anything with my mic. Is everything okay? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, that's fine. That's fine. I will deal with where it's gone. Um, I, I will just speak now. <laughs> um, so thank you, Stella, um, for your welcome. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, can I thank Sarah for inviting me to speak at the launch of the Inclusive Education Network? Having heard about the plans for this network, it's great that the day is finally here and we're off. And it's a real privilege to have been asked to speak about inclusion. It's something that's very close to my heart. It's something that I've spent my professional life teaching about, writing about, thinking about, and indeed just generally trying to put into practice in as many aspects of my life as possible. So thank you for allowing me to share some thoughts this afternoon. It's perhaps really quite timely that this network is starting now. In the last 10 days or so, two key reports um, both related to inclusion have been published, but more about them later. For just now, I want you to, I want you to come with me. I want to take you back to 1978. Now, some of you weren't even born then, but for me, I was just about to start studying at Jordan Hill College of Education to become a primary teacher. Now, those of you familiar with inclusion, when I said the date 1978, probably immediately thought, ah, the Warnock Report. And of course, you'd be absolutely right. That is the year that the Warnock Report was published and the ideas around special education really started to be challenged. And I well remember sitting in a lecture theatre at Jordan Hill, listening to Carol Hewitt talking about this new report that had just come out. And since 1978, Scotland has been grappling with the issues that Warnock raised. We've been trying to implement legislation and policy and practice that supports young learners and has changed and developed as our understanding about concepts of learning and teaching and inclusion have developed over the years. Who remembers Every Child is Special, published just before the demise of Strathclyde Regional Council? another document perhaps familiar to some of you. But today's about a new network, so why on earth am I talking to you about the past? Well, actually, I think the past can explain the present, but it doesn't have to define the future. But to think of the future without acknowledging the past, I do think leaves us open to criticism and to repeating mistakes. We found ourselves in a place that six months ago, right now, we just wouldn't have thought was even imaginable. So the future seems very insecure. I've just been at a meeting in my university talking about returning to campus, one meter, two meters. How, what are we gonna do? Very insecure. And yet it also offers us possibilities mm -hmm. because to go back to what we had six months ago, 
whether that's in relation to education, the economy or health, it doesn't necessarily seem a very good idea to me. One thing the pandemic has done, I think, is to highlight and spotlight the fissures and, and, and chasms across societies, across the globe, in terms of poverty and inequity. So going back for some might be quite comforting, but going back for others means continued exclusion and continued lack of opportunity. So if we're to move forward, and if this network is to be part of that movement, well, where are we in Scotland? What's the current state of play? Following extensive consultation period, there was the publication of the guidance on the presumption to provide education in the mainstream setting 2019. One of those document titles just bare rolls off the tongue. Published, of course, by the Scottish Government, where there was a clear, uh, uh, sort of, uh, the government clearly restated its commitment to delivering mainstream within an inclusive approach which recognises diversity and holds ambition that all children and young people are enabled to achieve, achieve to their fullest potential. And it was to apply in all the educational settings. Those of you who know me well, those of you who have studied with me will know that I have a real pet hate of that term, fullest potential. I can see actually, before this, you all disappeared off my screen, I could see some of you had actually reached your full potential. Don't even know why you were here. Um, We'll come back to that another day maybe. But they want young people to succeed. They build their policy around four features of inclusive education, that young people will be present, participating, achieving and supported within a clear single vision for Scottish education, excellence and equity for every child and young person in Scotland, they said. Oh my goodness, these are grand words. In fact, it's really not a bad vision at all. But legislation and policy need to be enacted. What does it look like in practice? What does it feel like for teachers, for the young people themselves, and for parents? Angela Morgan's report published just last week on additional support for learning in Scotland, and I quote, affirmed that additional support for learning is not visible or equally valued within Scotland's education system. Now, I'm sure that many of us here this afternoon could tell each other of things that have happened and things that have been said and done in Scottish schools that would clearly demonstrate that additional support for learning is not visible or valued with equally valued within Scottish education. I certainly have stories that I'm happy to share with you about some of the highly young, young, highly able young learners that I work with in Scotland. The report went on to acknowledge that all school staff need to have more knowledge and understanding of additional support needs and why? So they can meet the needs of everyone. Now, I know from my discussions with Angela as she travelled the length and breadth of Scotland talking to people that time and again in her conversations, the teacher was crucial in how the legislation and policy were enacted. Now, don't get me wrong, I know that budgets, funding, resources, all these things are really important too. But even if those things were all in place, I would suggest that it still might not be enough. There are implications in this report, I think, for teacher education. And while I think that many of the recommendations are really good, I'm not sure that, for example, I would agree with the idea of specialisms within initial teacher education. Because remember what the report said? All school staff need to have more knowledge and understanding of additional support needs. And why was that? So they can meet the needs of everyone. If teachers start off their careers without understanding the principles of inclusive education and inclusive practice, then I fear for inclusive practice in Scottish schools. And I worry for the young people sitting in Scottish classrooms. A week ago, UNESCO published their annual Global Education Monitoring Report, which this year is focusing, of course, on inclusion and education. This year's report shows that all over the world, layers of discrimination on the basis of gender, remoteness, wealth, disability, ethnicity, language, migration, <coughs> placement, bless you, incarceration, sexual orientation, gender identity and expression, 
religion and other beliefs and attitudes deny students the right to be educated with their peers or to receive education of the same quality. If you came here today in any doubt as to why an inclusion network is needed, I hope that helps to give you an answer. And as can be seen from the UNESCO list, inclusion is much more than talking about children who require additional support for learning. The UNESCO report found that across the world, discrimination, stereotyping and stigmatisation mechanisms are similar for all learners at risk of exclusion. Now, while 68% of the countries had a definition of inclusive education, only 57% of those definitions cover multiple marginalised groups. You see, that's one of the things that worries me about the recommendation in the Additional Support for Learning report that said there should be a first teaching qualification and additional support needs available during initial teacher education. Because, well, who's in and who's out? You see, my guess would be that autism, dyslexia and behaviour will be in, but what of those that are out? And I'm certainly pretty sure that in spite of what our legislation says, and it was groundbreaking, and in my view it was good and right, high ability will be well down the list, if they're there at all. And yet, my friend's just opened a research centre in the States. His life's work has been looking at high ability, suicide, mental health issues. There's lots of talk just now about developing vaccines and the skills we're going to need that will get us out of this economic disaster. Now, don't get me wrong, high label learners are not saviours of the world and neither do they have all the answers, but they have to be and should be part of the inclusion story. Because for too long, high ability, or as the rest of the world, with the exceptions of Wales and herself, would call them gifted and talented, have been, rightly by the way, seen as exclusionary device of an elite. But it doesn't have to be. It shouldn't be. And it isn't if systems and structures start from a point of rights-based, not needs-based education, where it seeks to operate under inclusive principles. The UNESCO support report suggests that debating the benefits of inclusive education can be seen as tantamount to debating the, the benefits of the abolition of slavery or indeed apartheid. Inclusion edu in education is a process. It's not an end point. So for 42 years since 1978, sitting in that lecture theatre, listening to Carol Hewitt speak about Warnock, I've been thinking in one way or another about inclusion. In thinking about this talk, it made me wonder what was happening 42 years before 1978? Well, the Second World War hadn't started. The Education Scotland Act raised the school leaving age to 15. There was a new definition secondary education and that saw the tweaking of an education Scotland Act from wait get this 1872. There were also some education circulars that perhaps chime with the present age. The provision of milk for school children or those who came um, into certain courses of instruction under the Unemployment Act of 1934. Uh, food banks anyone? Free school meals? Lunch boxes provided throughout the pandemic? be in no doubt as to why we need an inclusion network in 2020. The school broadcasting, in 1936, the circular went round saying that school broadcasting had become an integral part of the work in many schools in Scotland. The Scottish Education Department issued the circular making some brief comments and suggestions with the object of avoiding any waste of effort and loss of school time that may arise from failure to make a fully effective use of this new educational service. Uh, pivoting to online learning, anyone? Blended learning? Be in no doubt why we need an inclusion network in 2020. I wish the network well, and I have no doubt that the debates and discussions will be wide-ranging, illuminating, and maybe even tense at times. But I would encourage the network to be bold. Don't just talk amongst ourselves. We need to get out there and challenge. We need to engage with government. We need to engage with the media, with social media, with researchers, with teachers, with parents, and the young people. No single approach or activity will change a system, but there's much more going on across Scotland that has made us more inclusive. Now, this is not to claim that all the issues have been addressed 
or suggest that we have arrived. There's much more still to be done on the journey towards more inclusive schools. Last summer, my colleague Margaret McCulloch, who's here this afternoon, and I wrote an editorial for the British Journal of Special Education, and we said that politically, the UK is an, at an interesting point, with the departure date from the European Union fast approaching. Uncertainty about the economic impact of this is making many nervous, with academics and the press alike commenting on the potential fallout. There's general agreement that it's likely to be the poor that will be most affected by any changes. While much attention has been focused on Brexit, the other aspects of government continue. And so, within this uncertain political context, we must continue on the road of social justice and inclusion. Now, the pandemic hadn't even entered Margaret and I's heads last August when we were writing that, but it holds true for the context we find ourselves in now. So I'll conclude this talk, my talk, my part of this talk, with our final sentence from that editorial. We cannot revert to segregation and labelling and end up back where we were four decades ago. The Inclusive Education Network, I'm adding this bit, we didn't write this in the editor editorial, but the Inclusive Education Network is needed in 2020. Thank you very much for listening and I'll hand over to George. Thank you, Margaret, that was great. Yeah, thanks, Margaret, that was really thought provoking. Um, I would also like to thank Sarah for inviting me to speak at the launch of this Inclusive Education Network as an honour. And I would like to acknowledge the hard work of the, and efforts of those who have founded the, the network and also the hard work of Stella, Diane and Lisa in setting up this event. Um, I think it's important that CIRA has an inclusive education network to bring together the academics, teachers, students and indeed everyone who's interested and to provide a context in which our ideas, our experiences, as well as things like theory, policy and practice can be explored. I would like to think about some of the language that has emerged recently in all our lives, some as a consequence of the pandemic, and also one very small but hugely important word in Angela Morgan's report, all, the word all. And that's at the back of my mind um, in everything that I say uh, in the rest of this wee talk. First though, a little bit of old language just to illustrate how the language that we use reflects and influences the contemporary thinking and practice. I'm not going as far back as Margaret, I'm only going to go about 20 years and a little bit more. Uh, and at that time, the literature regarding inclusion in the United Kingdom generally centered largely around the debate on the difference between inclusion and integration. The focus was on pupils with special educational needs and disabilities, and policy was based on assumptions that in order for those children to be in mainstream schools, schools would need to compensate for what those children and young people could not do. Um, but in Scotland, I think, at, at least we, in terms of teacher education, moved very quickly away from this deficit model towards a vision of inclusion um, based on support and provision for all learners rather than exceptionality. So consequently, uh, I think inclusive education in Scotland looks very different from what it did 20 years ago, but also looks quite different from what it does um, in other countries from what I can see through my work with Weira, Ira and Sira. Anyway, so to the present, new normal is a phrase that is in current use. However, instead of new normal, I want to think about the new knowledge which will inform any new normal. I also want to consider the concept of blending and the implications of both new knowledge and blending for children, young people, schools, teachers, teacher education and for research. When I talk about new knowledge, I, do, I don't mean anything earth shattering. I just mean the subtle changes in thinking that nudge forward the ways in which we become more inclusive in schools, universities and in our research. 
new knowledge can emerge through any number of activities. But typically, it's the result of sustained engagement with others through new materials, through context uh, in, in which we engage and which we come to appreciate um, the, 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 the perspectives of others in a way that we did not do before. So blended learning, blended learning, of course, is common in higher education. Many of our programs at master's level, for instance, have been a mixture of distance and face-to-face -face learning for years. And they seem to work very well, by the way. Um, the recent discussions on the prospect of blended learning for schools, however, has prompted me to think more widely about the concept of blending itself, the extent to which we do this already, and how we might explore it to, as I say, nudge forward inclusive education. So, new knowledge blending and what it might mean for children, young people, teachers and researchers and teacher educators. Children and young people will have had a range of experiences of lockdown. They will have engaged in imaginative and creative play and activi activities just because that's what they do. As a result, they will have learned and developed new knowledge about themselves as learners. There are likely to be pupils who will have experienced schoolwork differently in a positive way, who have maybe engaged with their learning at their own pace, in their own terms, in their own time. And also, in addition to that, anecdotally, we've probably all heard of examples of children and young people learning new things and developing skills and interests not directly connected to schoolwork. They have already blended their own ways of organising and engaging with their learning, with their own interests and, and all the people with whom they've interacted they, during this period. There's also, of course, been reports of some children and young people not engaging with schoolwork during lockdown and therefore supposedly missing out and who will have difficulty catching up. Such concerns are based on a particular view of the nature and purpose of education, but that's another discussion too large for here. The likelihood is that all young people will have learned new things and have a stronger sense of themselves, both as people and as learners. For me, it's important that this new knowledge is sought out, we recognize it, and we take it into account as we endeavor to make education more inclusive. We're in a unique context and should take the opportunity to engage children and young people's new skills, new really realized abilities and personal interests, and blend them into practice and pedagogy in schools as we simultaneously explore new ways to allow them to demonstrate their learning. So an enhanced pedagogy, an inclusive pedagogy, and ways to help them demonstrate their learning. Doing so, of course, is a task of schools and teachers, who, like the pupils, they've also learned things about themselves, about their colleagues, about the children and young people that they work with. On social media, um, in relation to inclusion, I've seen a lot of um, tweaks and things regarding the importance of relationships. And that, again, has actually sent me thinking uh, anew about what is the appropriate relationship between learner and teacher? Teachers know that young people's emotional experience of learning is as important as their cognitive experience. Inclusive teachers already blend these aspects that we've been talking about in providing learning experiences for their pupils. Indeed, blending is part of teachers' everyday lives as they cope with quite often competing demands from pupils, parents, schools, local authorities and government. The current situation presents, as I said, a unique stimulus for teachers to make sense of the relationships that they have with each of these aspects, but especially the relationship with pupils. As a, inclusive teachers already see their pupils as learners and not people who have to be taught. They will already be aware of pupils' skills, abilities and interests and the new experiences which young people bring to school will be used to enhance and enrich the learning of all young people. 
Similarly, teachers' interactions with, pu with pupils during lockdown will have enriched their own sense of themselves as teachers, and in, I suppose in many cases, their, their own sense of themselves as parents, and their place in the lives of their charges. This new knowledge will enhance pedagogy, focusing on their pupils and students as learners, rather than rushing to catch up in the curriculum, will help reinforce any new sense that pupils have of themselves as learners and teachers have of themselves as teachers. Blending the curriculum uh, with children's abilities and capabilities helps develop a pedagogy that complements what they can do rather than compensates for any perceived inability or disability. The relationship between teacher and learner is based in trust and that trust is built and nurtured in classrooms where children feel valued, that they belong and crucially where they learn. Universities have an important role to play in the development of inclusive education. And just as students and teachers have learned new things about themselves, so will teacher educators and researchers. The task for teacher educators is, of course, similar to that of teachers, to take what their learners are good at and help them enhance it. It's the job of teacher educators, teachers, students and researchers to interrogate the interactions among theory, policy and practice. And for the advancement of inclusive education, our efforts should finally enhance our understanding and practice of inclusive pedagogy. Research in inclusive education that follows um, could well become increasingly inclusive, I'm suggesting. We might want to think of new ways of conceiving and constructing research that go beyond the involvement of teachers and young people as active participants. We might also want to engage in more collaborative and collective research and seek out ways that makes that research uh, enhanced quality and creates new contexts in which new knowledge can emerge. And I can give you examples of these things that I've been talking about if necessary. CIRA, of course, also has a role to play. And for me, that's why it's so important that this network is launched today. The network will provide a new space in which inclusive education can be explored, that can be theorised, researched, and from the perspectives of all involved. And part of its purpose will have to be to generate the new knowledge that will increasingly and unrelentingly nudge forward our understanding of inclusive education and inclusive pedagogy. Thank you once again for allowing me to speak at this launch. Thank you, George. Uh, now, Diane, I will continue with coordinating the discussion. I can see there are several comments and questions. Please feel free to add your comments and questions to the chat box. Okay, so thank you very much, Stella. And I'd also like to echo my thanks to Margaret and to George for um, for helping to launch the network. Um, so I'm going to come to Paul's, Paul Campbell's um, comments. Um, and you had a question as well, Paul. Um, would you like to unmute yourself and maybe come in and um, give us a wee bit more information and start the discussion rolling? Yeah, thank you, first of all, to George and Margaret for <clears throat> a great opportunity to connect and um, reflect a little bit as well. And I think my question was around, I, f I feel like it's very common um, when you do any sort of uh, policy study or policy analysis, um, whether it's in Scotland or around the world, frequently the recommendations or the responses at the end of that review um, or what, and whatever topic might be in relation to is that it comes back down to initial teaching education. And I think my point here was that initial teaching education can only do so much and actually I think the points were made quite clearly that we do need to reach um, the wider profession and educators and all roles that might be working in across the across different sectors. So I think my question is about what maybe Margaret and George think about how we actually reach those teachers while also thinking about, I think after um, George's contribution, thank you again for that George, um, it was making me think a lot about the fact that we do spend a lot of time thinking about what teachers and school leaders need to be thinking about or rethinking differently. 
perhaps without thinking about the new knowledge we might need about whether or not it actually is the systems and structures that are influencing how teachers and school leaders respond. Perhaps we need to be looking at that, um, maybe not instead, but to help us come up with more complex responses to these complex problems. So basically, how do, where, where do we go next? Um, how do we reach those other educators beyond initial teacher education? Okay. Um, Margaret, I saw that you'd started to respond in the chat. Do you want to elaborate on that? And then maybe George would like to come in as well. Margaret, you're muted. Mute, sorry. Um, what I had started to say was that, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a bit like in school. When something goes wrong in society, stick it into the curriculum in school. That will sort it. Um, and it's a wee bit like that. You can feel like that a little bit in, in initial teacher education. And, you know, in the grand scheme of things, we have you... We have you know, student teachers for such a short time, sometimes not even a calendar year if it's a PGDE um, or for four years if it's, if it's a, a longer programme than that, but even that's still a short time. And so for me, we, we can't do everything. We can't cover everything. And so for me, it's about, well, what are the basic first principles that we do need to cover? And for me, that would be around things like inclusive uh, principles, inclusive practice, so that um, in fact, things like, for example, the National Framework for Inclusion, where that, that sort of first column where, where you're having to think really hard about yourself because it is that whole idea about teaching being such a personal thing that you engage in. So knowing about yourself, knowing what you think, knowing what your, your beliefs are about all of, of, of uh, the whole thing around difference and ability and all of these things, I think if you can start to explore all of that in initial teacher education, um, and as you go out into the profession, it then becomes really important that that learning is lifelong. And that's why I think when we, we had, um, you know, we had really thought about that a lot in Scotland, about how you have, you have um, your, your 35 hours, and that's not, not a huge number of hours, but you've, you've got time where you then started to think in context, because I can well remember sitting with first year students, as I was talking about collaboration, kind of looking at me going, well, yeah, of course you talk to the parents. And I'm thinking, oh, you've so not sat in a meeting or you've so not tried to, to chat and reason with a, a child. Um, so, you know, there, there's knowing it up here and then there's knowing it and experiencing it. So I think it's a continual process, like inclusion is a process and a journey. I think learning about this is a process and a journey too. And I'll stop at that point, George. And yeah. log in the background. Yeah, I can hear them. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Somebody's come to the door. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Paul, um, you're, you're dead right. And, and it's something that has exercised us for, for many years and for as long as I can remember. Um, Margaret mentioned, for example, the, 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 the framework for inclusion. Um, and before that, we had something called, uh, it's now the Scottish University Inclusion Group. It had a great big long name before that. Um, but basically it was all the teacher education um, institutions before we, we joined the universities actually, um, who came together and, and to explore and talk about and do the kind of things, how we do the kind of things that, that, that you're um, suggesting there that, uh, that you're um, pointing at. And we've been doing that for many a year now, for a long time, we've got the framework, we've got all sorts of things, but you're right, it's, a, it's, it's the age-old um, difficulty of how, how, do, how do we continue, um, how, first of all, how do we initiate that in, in, in initial teacher education? And a lot of the initial teacher education courses now um, contain elements of having students explore themselves as learners from the outset. Um, and uh, uh, in terms of CPD, well, um, there, <laughs> we used to have direct CPD. That doesn't seem to be the case anymore. Um, I don't, and the, the, mundos, the money doesn't seem to be there for it anymore um, and hasn't been for a, a long while. But we've been trying other things to, to spread that mess, to keep the message going. And it's difficult because there aren't the avenues there to do it other than um, when people come to um, do master's degrees. That's the way you take it forward. We need to find other ways. And part, I, part of the work I think of this inclusive education network 
um, will be to take that message forward to, to seek out those participants from all uh, aspects of uh, education so that, that this, this aspect of all that's in uh, Angela Morgan's report in actual fact becomes some kind of reality. Okay, thank you so much, um, both of you. Um, I'm just looking in the chat and um, Paul Adams has started to um, open up a discussion around language, um, which Jane and Cara have also um, added to. So I'm just going to um, pull that together in a question and could I maybe ask Margaret and George, we have had a lot of changes in language over the past 20 odd 40 years, as you've alluded to. Um, what do you think those changes in language mean in practice? And what do you think inclusive education might look like in the future? That's a biggie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I'm quite happy to Yeah, you go for it, George. Yeah, okay, Margaret. Yeah, I, I think the changes in language um, can be significant. But just, just to illustrate a little bit, when I talk about new knowledge, I don't necessarily, I, I'm really not talking about things that um, appear suddenly, um, you, you know, like new discoveries. I'm talking about things that take a long, long time um, to be realised. As we engage with something like inclusion, we come to know what it means through um, sustained engagement with the whole idea of inclusion. And I think that's reflected in some of the language. Other places have hung on to the language of special educational needs much longer than we have. And although we move to additional support for learning, which I've still got issues with, especially that word additional, um, nevertheless, I think it did signal uh, a shift in thinking it, it both signaled that shift in a sense that it was already happening, but it also encouraged that shift to take place further. And the, dif the difference between it was the shift away from inability and disability that, um, and deficit that special educational needs entails and the, a move towards ideas of supporting all pupils at some time and towards provision and support that so even acknowledging that there will be some degree of if you like academic piety and in, in the use of the language or linguistic piety at least in the, in the change of the language um, um i think it does encourage change but that change is never swift nothing is in education and um, it takes a long time because people need to engage with the idea they need to um, interrogate that idea and they need to explore it with others in order to um, enhance their understanding of it. So what will it look like in the future? Who knows? I know what I would like to see and that's all pupils in, all sco in schools all the time that, uh, as far as possible I suppose. I suppose I've always got to qualify that um, when I don't really want to right? because there may be some something that doesn't work. But in all, I always said that when I worked in mainstream school, uh, sorry, when I worked in special schools uh, for children who at that time, the phrase we used was social, emotional and behavioral difficulties. Um, I always said that there was nothing that I did in a special school that could not have been done in a mainstream school if mainstream schools had been prepared to change. And I think what part of the challenge for inclusive education is to challenge the hegemony of the mainstream um, and, um, and to work towards that change. Okay, thank, thank you. I'm aware that we're just coming up on a quarter to five, so we have got a couple more questions in the chat that I'll come to. Um, but just before I do, um, as an inclusive education network, and as Mariam has said in the 
in the chat box she's asking um what's the what is the remit of the network um we're very much a fledgling network and we have a question for all of you um and that is what can we as an inclusive education network do to support you to support teachers schools university colleagues parents the wider community with meeting the needs of all children um if you've got any ideas right now please pop them into the chat box and if you come up with ideas over maybe the next 24 48 hours and um, please um send them along to us as well um i'm just going to pick up on um david's comments and questions um david's mentioned about unesco and the scottish parliament debating inclusion um and a question around um systems being on a journey with inclusive education and do we seem to be going backwards david do you want to come in and just elaborate on that a wee bit and then maybe margaret and george could give their thoughts hi there is that okay mm -hmm. yeah i think just the, the idea that um over the past number of years, there's been uh, three debates in the Scottish Parliament, and at the end of it, they agree that uh, mainstreaming is a laudable intention, but we need more children to go to special school. Um, so there's been a growth in numbers attending special schools in Scotland. Um, and I think part of that is, is shown up in Angela Morgan's report. The bit that's missing in there is a discussion of the learning environment in the classroom as being a place that diversity is welcomed. Um, so I'm not sure she's fully engaged with the social model of disability and uh, how the environment contributes to, to uh, disabilities and support needs, rather than it just being a case of individual differences. So I think there's concepts about that haven't been fully engaged with and are not being taken forward within Scotland when you compare how the UNESCO report or the International Disability Alliance report is setting that out on a wider systems basis. Okay, thank, thank you. Margaret, George, would you like to respond? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think you're right. I think there are issues that haven't been uh, fully explored by uh, the government, by society, by the media. Um, uh, just, well, maybe three weeks ago, um, four weeks ago, perhaps, there was an item as I was waking up at quarter to seven on BBC Radio Scotland, where they were talking about young people with additional support needs during lockdown, how they'd been ignored, um, inclusion, blah, 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 and immediately went to a special school. Now, I'm not saying they shouldn't have done that, but it was very interesting that they're sort of the way they framed the whole discussion was around that kind of debate. Um, and I think the language, certainly you talking about language, George, the, the language you see often um, is, is not helpful in some of that. So I think there are many issues that are still to be teased out and thought through. Um, Jane's just added to the chat there, I think we need to think what we mean by mainstream. Well, absolutely. I was once said, actually, if you were going to force me, to, was, we're in that whole debate. Is it, and the big question is, is inclusion just about location? not convinced it is but if you're going to force me then actually let's close down all mainstream schools and actually let's all become special schools you know sometimes you see fantastic inclusive practice in special schools units etc straight ahead to some of the stuff you see sometimes in mainstream so you know there's there's huge big debates and discussions i think uh, still to be had george do you want to say anything Oh. No, I've not got a lot to add to that. Um, but, but David's quite right. Um, you know, the, 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 there's an awful lot that, that has not been discussed or, or not been discussed enough or explored enough. Um, just a, a couple of things. You know, you know, there are examples of the things that we are thinking about and talking about throughout the country, throughout Scotland. Um, for example, I've, one of my stories I always talk to my students about is the fact that my wife comes from Isla and there's no such thing and never has been such a thing as exclusion on Isla. Well, there is now actually. Um, but, but it was an alien concept to her altogether. And it's the same in many of our, 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 our rural places, our rural schools. Children belong in their locality and that's where they're educated. We can see all that happening. Um, so there are, 
we sometimes we don't need to look too too far for the the, the if you like the evidence that we need, but we don't always see it. We don't always see it. Um, my worry about the reports, I think it, it's similar to your own, Margaret, is that what they will do is they will take that people will take their recommendations and to in response to David, I, I think this is the kind of thing that has been happening. The people take the recommendations and they turn them into a tick box exercise and say, right, that's us, that we'll do this, we'll do that, that that's that. We've done it, we've done inclusion now. Um, whereas it's to me, it's not in anyone's gift to do inclusion. You can't do inclusion. It can't be done to people. People need to be, as I say, it's not a doing word, it's a being word. People need to be included. They need to feel included. Mm -hmm. That's all okay. I want. That's, that's fabulous. Thank you so much, George and Margaret. Um, we're out of time for questions, unfortunately. Um, I am capturing everything from the chat because there's some really rich discussion and information there. So as a network, we will be able to go back and explore that and hopefully pick up some conversations. Um, if um, Marianne's saying that she's got a write-up, she'll send it to us. Please do. If you've got if you've got things there that you think would be beneficial, please send them our way. Um, so that's the end of the discussion. I'm going to hand over to Lisa for final thoughts and comments. Lisa. Thank you, Diane. And thank you, George and Margaret. Um, it was thought provoking. Um, it was absolutely wonderful to, to listen to you and um, you gave us loads to think about, loads of um, ideas and um, lots of thinking to be done. Um, there are, I've, I've made some notes and there are so many, so many points that I want to, to think about myself and when we turn to, and um, it, it is great that this, um, uh, this event is being captured so that we, we, we will have the opportunity to revisit it. I'm going to start from Margaret's uh, very positive and, and hopeful um, point that the current circumstances are challenging, but also they offer many opportunities. And I, and I think what, what um, stuck with me through the, both Margaret's and George's um, talk is the hope, um, looking, looking forward and, and the hope that together we, we, can, we can move forward. Um, Margaret, I really, I really um, like your point that we need to remember that inclusion is, is much broader than additional support needs. We need to remember that um, there are many marginalized groups, uh, there are groups and individuals that experience discrimination for, for various reasons. There is intersectionality, there is overlapping um, discrimination and, and marginalization that many experience so it is important to remember that inclusion is, is much broader than additional support needs but also i liked what you said about uh, how the emphasis you put to, on we cannot revert to segregation and, and a deficit model um, inclusion as you said margaret is not a, a destination it is a process but we need to be moving forward and we, we must continue, as you said, on, on, the, on the road um, to inclusion and um, engage with others. And uh, it's, no, it's not a road that we, we, can, we can take on, on our own. We need to engage with others and uh, this uh, network hopefully provides an opportunity for that engagement. George, I really liked um, the, the emphasis on, on learning and how the, the new knowledge and, and how we can nudge inclusion forward through, through engaging with the learning, the new learning and the new knowledge that has taken, um, taken place during these bleak times. So yes, I fully agree with you. Children have learned a lot in various ways and um, teachers have learned a lot and, and teacher educators have learned a, a, a lot as well. And it is very important to, to reflect on that learning and it is very important to take that learning forward as, as we move to a new school year, a, a new academic year. And maybe there will be some lessons that we can learn through um, 
engage him with this new learning, new knowledge, and new ways of learning. So perhaps there will be some lessons that, that we can learn about that can help us be more inclusive in, in our thinking, but also in our practice. So, so these are um, points that um, uh, really touched me and I just wanted to, to reiterate and, and thank you again for, for giving us so much to think about. So I think that's bringing us to the end. So perhaps uh, we'll ask Nicola to um, do the official close. Yes, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much to um, Stella and Diane and Lisa and George and Margaret for um, being part of the session today and organising it. I really enjoyed it um, and I have been actually involved in some work within physical education and inclusion with European partners over the past year and it's really interesting the, the discussion there that we, you've been having around language because I know that's one of the aspects that we initially had to uh, think about. So thank you to everybody for coming along. Um, the advice in the chat is if you have anything to share and you want to give your ideas into the network, then please email the um, conveners. Um, you've got Stella there, Diane there. Please email them. Their information is up on the website. And I know that they will be planning some future events. Um, and that way they can um, keep you informed of future events. Is there anything else you wanted to add in, Stella? Or uh, yes, thank you all for your attendance and thanks to uh, Margaret and George um, for the great thoughts and discussion. I would just like to encourage people to uh, send us questions uh, or continue the discussions via Twitter. I have included our hashtag here and I will also um, copy and paste our website. Okay, thanks all. Yeah. Thank I you. think actually I can just put up the screen there. Um, I can share that because I think I've got the details there. Oh, I've gone on too far. There you go. So there's some of the aims of the network and the details. And as I said, please contact um, Stella, Lisa and Diane. If you're interested in the network, want to know more, got any thoughts to share, um, yeah, please do. So thank you everybody for attending today. A really great session particularly George and Margaret, really good uh, points that have raised lots of discussion. The chat has gone um, gone wild as it did before, <laughs> as it has at some of our other sessions. So it's great to see that and um, really good to see people engaging. Um, so have a nice evening, everybody. And we hope to see you. Our next CIRA Connects event is um, at the beginning of July with Mark Priestley, which unfortunately is now sold out. But we have another in um, at the end of July with um, Professor Walter Humes talking about Scottish education. So please join us for that one. OK. Thank you, everybody. Um, if anybody from the network or the executive wants to remain on, we can just have a brief debrief if you want to. OK. Thanks, everyone. Bye.